Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Danny, and I'm with the learning team at Cherry Beckert. Just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. For audio during today's webinar, you may listen through the phone or the computer speakers. You can choose your audio under the audio tab in the menu to the right of your screen. To earn CPE for today's webinar, please make sure you answer all the polling questions. Make sure you click the submit button to submit your answers. Instructors will try to remind you of this as each poll appears. We will be distributing CPE certificates via email in the coming week. The instructors and I will answer questions in the question and answer pod. We will try to answer them throughout the webinar. Finally, we will be sending out a link for the evaluation following the webinar. Please take two minutes to provide feedback. That's all for the housekeeping announcements and I will turn it over to the team. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Sarah McGregor and I'll be uh, hosting as we walk through this program. Today, I'm delighted that we'll be talking about all the things that have been happening in state and local tax for during this year. Well, I don't think we can hit everything because a lot has happened uh, this year. But to help us with this discussion, we have Kathy Stanton. She is a par partner in our tax practice and our national leader for state and local tax services. And also Lauren Stinson. Lauren is a principal with our firm and she leads our sales and use tax services. So both of these uh, individuals have much experience and have been paying close attention to everything going on in, in uh, the states. And we'll be talking about trends and what to expect in 21 and later. As always, please be careful in using any information we provide in this webinar, uh, as we do not have time to cover in depthly all of the topics uh, and how they may relate to your circumstances. So with that, Kathy, I'll turn it over to you to give an overview of what will be covered today. Great, thanks, Sarah. Well, welcome everybody this morning. We actually have some snow outside of DC. I don't know where you are, but it's starting to begin uh, to look a bit like winter here. Uh, so today on the agenda, we're going to look at some income tax updates for 2020. We're going to talk about teleworking employees and how that may impact your state and local tax landscape. We will turn it over to Lauren and discuss uh, the evolving implications of Wayfair and some other sales tax items to be aware of, and also trends to watch in 2021. So we'll get started with um, tax updates, and we can go ahead to the next slide. The most important thing to think about with any federal legislative changes are how they impact the state from a conformity perspective. States generally will start, for most um, state purposes, they'll start with the federal taxable income as determined under the Internal Revenue Code. However, they will tie to the Internal Revenue Code on one of three methods. One is based on a rolling conformity, meaning that as soon as the federal legislation is enacted, it also applies at the state level. The second method is a fixed date conformity, uh, meaning that uh, we adopt the, that state adopts the Internal Revenue Code as of a specific date. Um, one good example of this is California. I'm not remembering the specific date off the top of my head, but it's been over a decade since <laughs> California has adopted, I believe, federal legislation. So they adopt sporadically different provisions at the state level. Um, so they review and really control what provisions at the federal level are applicable at the state level. And then we have selective conformity states where they really have their own definitions of taxable income and they just select certain provisions from the federal internal revenue code as they deem fit. And it, this really comes into play with regard to the CARES Act. Um, so the CARES Act that was enacted this year in this uh, crazy weird year that we hope to never repeat again, um, the CARES Act had adopted changes um, to really help spur um, the economy to help businesses through uh, this difficult period of time and impact 
um, on the economy. And so the first change that a couple changes were significant from a from a state tax perspective. The first being the federal net operating loss changes. So from a federal perspective, the CARES Act allows NOLs from 2018, 2019, and 2020 um, to be carried back five years. So cash could be um, received by these entities that were many of them probably in desperate need of cash or concerned about what their year was gonna look like and then trying to conserve cash. The 80% limitation on the use of NOL was temporarily suspended. Uh, and this was a limitation by TCJA, the Tax Reform Act, so that's temporarily suspended. And this resulted in many taxpayers filing amended returns or um, even currently taxpayers looking at filing amending returns uh, to carry back those NOLs. From a state perspective and how, um, how, how this really plays into the state tax computation, do the states allow NOL carrybacks? Well, in this area, most states have their own NOL carry forward and carry back provisions. So in many cases, they were not tied to the federal anyway. Um, but there are some states that are tied to the federal. So we come to the question of, will the states adopt that suspension of the 80% limitation? Or will they still follow um, that uh, the TCJA because they did not update their state tax conformity um, and still have an 80% limitation where that might be lifted from a federal perspective. So we have to look at state amended return implications of federal NOL carrybacks. Um, because when you're looking at uh, NOL carrybacks for federal purposes, if you have completely different rules for the state, you may have situations where you're actually increasing your federal taxable income in those prior periods um, because of certain methods of accounting or elections. And that might actually create taxable income at the state level where you're not allowed to, to carry back the NOL at the state level. So really take a look at the state implications of the net operating losses if you're if you're looking at this um, for cash recovery at your company level. And California has decoupled notoriously, as I mentioned before. So the second change that is very impactful at the state level is the 163J, the interest expense limitation. So we have federal tax limits to interest expense deductions enacted by TCJA, um, but the limitation on the deduction of the interest expense was increased from 30% of a taxpayer's adjusted taxable income to 50% for 2019 and 2020 under the CARES Act. Um, and also for tax years beginning in 2020, taxpayers may elect to use their 2019 adjusted taxable income to compute the interest expense limitation. And this would, by uh, the, the thinking is that they would have uh, less impact of that limitation because they were more profitable in 2019. So from a state consideration, uh, the rolling conformity states will likely adopt the increased limitation, but the fixed state conformity states, again, may not adopt that change in limitation. So you may have a 50% limitation for federal, but only 30% for states. But then if you're filing in multiple states, you have may have different limitations per state. So this certainly adds complexity um, from a state tax perspective. Uh, the 163J limitation, even just before the changes to the CARES Act, uh, makes state tax a, the state tax conformity very complicated. Um, and then you're looking at, if you have a consolidated group, how do you uh, take a look at how those limitations apply in a consolidated group level when only one entity of the consolidated group is filing in a separate return state? And, and how do these rules interplay? And, and those questions haven't really all been answered yet. So taxpayers should certainly be careful um, for the positions I mentioned before, uh, positions taken uh, for limitations as well and the impact at the state level. So, uh, you know, we also have related party interest rules. 
um, where from a state perspective, there was always this planning opportunity where you can shift income among entities and then in a separate return state, you can reduce that taxable income. Well, many states require an add back a related party interest. So does that add back occur before the limitation? Does the limitation occur first? Those are some of the complexities um, that are only now uh, even more complexities <laughs> added with the CARES Act. Qualified improvement property, there was a fix uh, for qualified leasehold improvements and the ability to depreciate uh, depreciate that type of property. And so the CARES Act fixed a glitch within the Tax Reform Act that the 15-year life and 100% um, bonus depreciation applies to this type of property. And it applies to property placed in service after 12-31-2017. So from a state perspective, again, if you have rolling conformity where they adopt the depreciation, you may have additional benefit at the state level, but not all states conform. So you may have a differences and add backs at the state level with regard to this depreciation. Now moving on to PPP loans, payroll protection uh, loans, and I'm sure everyone is familiar with this. And also uh, this came about um, through our COVID crisis and trying to keep people on the payroll giving businesses uh, funds to actually pay for that payroll as opposed to having so many people dumped into the unemployment tax system. Here are some states, uh, many, a few of states, first four are generally in our typical footprint area for our firm, and we have Massachusetts here as well. Generally, um, generally states are tending to conform to the loan forgiveness. And now we have issues that we're following at the federal level as well, uh, where at the federal level, it has been determined, the IRS has indicated that the forgiveness will not be, or that that loan income and the forgiveness will not be considered uh, taxable income to the taxpayer. However, there's some issue with regard to if you're forgiven the if you're forgiven reporting income the loan forgiveness piece that you cannot deduct the expense piece for what you use the loan proceeds for uh, that i think you know is is going to be um, potentially changed you know with a new administration i don't think um, that the government meant to uh, to do that, they wanted to provide the benefit to the taxpayer. Um, so we're probably gonna see some changes there, but right now the general thinking is, yes, the forgiveness is not taxable, but the expenses aren't deductible. So you end up kind of at a, a neutral point there. Um, the, the states have generally conformed to that for the states that have issued guidance, but not many of the states have issued guidance. Um, one interesting take on that is that Section 61, which is your general gross income statute at the federal level, was not amended. So some states or some practitioners are thinking, if the code wasn't really amended, um, is it really amended for state tax purposes? So they, they're just having different thinking on this, but so far, uh, most of the guidance that has come out is that they will conform, but in Massachusetts, they do not conform for individuals, they do for corporate, and they do, and then Maine also does not conform. So we need to really take a close look uh, at this, if this applies to your company, to make sure we get it right at the state level. Moving on to economic nexus and market-based sourcing, I just want to say that the, one of the biggest trends that we have been seeing, and it is not stopping anytime soon, is the economic nexus theory. Uh, not only did we see it in sales tax, which Lauren will discuss, but in the income tax area, economic nexus has been alive and well. What does this mean? If you have income coming from sources within a state, or you have income from services where benefits were delivered to a state or received in a certain state, states are now taking the position and have uh, for quite a while on the income tax side that the company has income tax nexus and they should be filing income tax returns. I will say the majority of states, I think Missouri is the only state that says you have to have physical presence still. The majority of all the rest of the states now say that you don't have to have physical presence in the state to have an income tax filing obligation. 
This is coupled with generally market-based sourcing of revenue, meaning that when you're filing your return, you're determining where revenue comes from based on where the customers reside, where that benefits delivered or received. Most of, I shouldn't say most, but maybe up to uh, certainly over half the states now have market-based sourcing. The states that do not have it are moving toward it. Economic nexus and market-based sourcing go hand in hand because you could have economic nexus somewhere, but if there's no income source there, who cares? There's no income tax. You really need to have a market-based sourcing of revenue in addition to economic nexus for that state to benefit from out-of-state taxpayers. They love this method of taxation because they're exporting the tax liability and not increasing tax on their in-state constituents. So Texas this year for the 2020 franchise tax return, uh, the one that was just due uh, last month on extension, uh, based on 2019 income and revenue, if uh, revenue, uh, gross receipts of 500000 or more came from Texas, you had to file a Texas franchise tax return. And I will say this relates to sales of tangible personal property as well, uh, and, and not just, you know, looking at other types of income. We will talk a little bit about Public Law 86272 and what's happening, um, but there are companies that depend on this federal public law that says, if I sell tangible personal property and don't have any physical presence or I'm only soliciting in the state, I don't have to file an income tax return there. Well, Texas, their franchise tax return is not an income tax. Um, so any $500,000, any company, any taxpayer, they, they actually regard single member LLCs and disregarded entities as well, although they do have unitary reporting. If you're receiving 500,000 of revenue from Texas, you should have filed a franchise tax return um, in the state of Texas. One interesting thing is that they have not yet adopted market-based sourcing for services. So us as a tax accounting firm, we actually do have, a, a Cherry Becker does have an office in Texas, but for example, if we did not have an office in Texas and all our work was performed outside of Texas, we wouldn't have any Texas sourced receipts because services look, Texas looks to where the services are actually performed to source revenue. Um, but we guarantee, I guarantee in, in my crystal ball that I'm looking uh, down in future years that they're going to change that. They're going to make it a market-based state so they can actually start taxing out-of-state sellers of services as well. So the trend um, 2020 and going forward, economic nexus alive and well for income tax. And in fact, it was alive and well pre-Wayfair. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Public Law 86-272 that that's still in play. Um, but otherwise, if you're doing anything other than selling tangible property, states are likely going to be looking to see whether you should be filing an income tax return in the state. All right, this brings us to our first polling question. Uh, Danny, if you'll go ahead and, and uh, pull that up. There we go. So will your business be taking advantage of CARES Act provisions that help to reduce taxes, either an NOL carryback or one of the uh, many employer-related uh, payroll relief situations or uh, one of the other provisions that allows for, uh, that was intended to allow for some additional cash coming back to taxpayers to help them during the pandemic. So we'll give you just a, a little bit more time. I see many of you are answering quickly and not sure is always good. It does not have to be a, a correct answer. It just needs to be an answer in order to award CPE credit. But we appreciate and are interested in how how you're faring here. So we I'll won't, give you that. We won't judge anybody on their answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. About uh, uh, about ten more seconds here to let those of you who are still still out there answering answering the polls. Um, and we did have a, a comment about um, PPP loans and and uh, the situation. Well, we're actively watching what's happening in Congress right now uh, to see if they will pass another uh, relief measure and bill and what might be in it from a tax perspective so uh, stay tuned if we get some a new law we'll we'll be sharing additional information 
All right, looks like uh, many of you said yes, about half of you said yes, some of you said no, and many of you said uh, not quite sure. So uh, that's great. Thank you, Danny. Let's go ahead and, and move on to our next section. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the pass-through entity state income tax elections. Um, the note, uh, the I an IRS notice came out um, just recently, just last month, and this relates to the SALT cap workaround. So from a federal perspective, TCJA put in place a $10,000 state and local tax deduction cap for individuals on their tax return. So states in a flurry, some states in a flurry, Connecticut, um, was looking at this, some other states also that have high state taxes that are, we're, we're really looking at that federal deduction as a way to kind of subsidize their tax bill or the tax bill for their residents, um, look to allow pass-through entities to make an election at the pass-through entity level to impose the tax, the, in, the income tax at the entity level instead of the individual level, thereby allowing that tax to become deductible for federal tax purposes for the individual. So if I'm a pass-through entity and I have lots and lots of income, instead of being limited to a $10,000 state income tax deduction on my individual return, my pass-through entity would be able to take that deduction and my K-1 would be reduced by that deduction, therefore I would get the benefit of it. Uh, so a few states had, had moved forward um, with regard to this opportunity of an, making an election. You can elect to uh, pay tax at the pass-through entity level and this IRS notice indicated that yes, that can work. So um, we're okay with that. So now we're, some states are looking at a flurry of kind of activity to enact an election, but it has to be balanced that um, Joe Biden's proposed tax bill or, or his proposed tax changes would actually remove this cap. And also it does sunset at 2025 as well. So how many states really will uh, in, allow for this pass-through entity election? Um, Maryland has provided that this election just this year, and what I will say, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this election is not simple. It was not it, it was not very clean. Um, the election applies only to resident owners, so you're electing to pay the pass-through entity level tax at the for resident owners at the pass-through entity level. Uh, so it's problematic because you could have unequal distributions or unequal distributions. You have to look at une um, a different class of stock for S-Corps. You have to have partnership agreements that allow you to make true ups. There are a lot of, of issues with Maryland uh, pass through entity level tax. However, we are expecting some technical corrections to uh, make this easier for pass-through entities to elect, but it is for this year. So what I would say for Maryland, um, and you can actually go to the next slide too, Sarah, um, for Maryland and all the rest of the states that have enacted the pass-through entity legislation, you must, uh, the pass-through entity, per the IRS notice, the pass-through entity has to pay the tax, and they're going to need to pay the tax in the 2020 tax year uh, to get that deduction, for the individuals to get that deduction. So if it makes sense, if you have a lot of income that's been apportioned to these states, uh, then that election could make sense. One thing I would caution you is that if you have non-residents of these states, you have to be careful in looking at the non-resident state to make sure that they get a credit for taxes paid to other states paid at the pass-through entity level. If their state does not allow a credit, you actually could have just increased the overall tax. So you have to, you have to be careful with that as well. Uh, make sure you check with your tax advisor on whether those elections make sense. I wanted to talk a little bit about Public Law 86272. Public Law 86272, as I mentioned, it's a federal law enacted way back in the 50s, prior to the internet even being thought of. <laughs> and it basically protects sellers of tangible personal property who are engaged in interstate commerce. It's actually, a, it's an archaic kind of law. It's actually very interesting when you look at, in light of what states are doing currently, and what the courts have allowed states to do currently in the area of nexus. We still have this federal law that says 
if I am a seller of tangible personal property and I am not soliciting for services at all, I'm only selling tangible personal property. And if the only thing I'm doing in a state is soliciting for sales, I could even have physical presence of sales reps uh, within the state. If, if that's the only thing I'm doing and product is being shipped into that state from outside of the state, this federal law says that that state cannot impose its income tax. So we have many clients that have been depending on this federal law protection, large clients, I mean, that are sellers of tangible personal property that have not had to file income tax returns in numerous states if they're only selling tangible personal property into the state. The Multi-State Tax Commission um, has, has, had, uh, has issued guidance, and they've issued various versions of the guidance over the years on how they interpret this protection to apply. And so the states that are members, whether they're full members, associate members of the Multi-State Tax Commission, which is probably about half, um, they adopt these, this guidance, and many other states look to this guidance for their own interpretation. I want to make you aware of something that is very, very concerning that it has just been approved uh, November 20th by the Multi-State Tax Executive Committee. They are reinterpreting Public Law 86272. Um, and what they're, and they believe this reinterpretation is needed in light of the modernized business world and how businesses business is conducted over the internet. And so the MTC has determined as a general rule, when a business interacts with a customer via the business's website or an app, okay, so if I we just have a website or an app. The MTC is saying that the business is engaging in a business activity within that customer state. So they're saying when that customer is on their own laptop or on their own phone and they're interacting with your website or your app, that you business are conducting business within that state. Wow, <laughs> I just have to step back and just say, this is monumental. Um, anyone who has been depending on Public Law 86272, you really need to take a look at this and what do we need to do here, if anything, or at least understand your risk. Um, if you go to the next slide, we have some examples of what they have within this information statement. So post-sales activity. Uh, so if you have any kind of electronic chat or, or email, um, they're clicking on your website and email, contact us, and anything, you're helping them with anything that doesn't relate to solicitation of a sale uh, is conducting activity in the state. If you're placing an internet cookie on, the, on their computer, you're gathering information that's going to be used with regard to stocking or determining what else um, new items you might want to come up with to offer, offer for sale, any business purpose, which most people are going to do, that creates nexus. Um, so, and you could go to the next slide too. I think I have one more on this. So any of these activities we're determining as actually occurring in the state. So how does that change from, you know, in the 1950s, if someone had a question about something outside of the solicitation of sales and using the telephone, you know, that use of that telephone wasn't the business conducting business in that state. And so the MTC didn't want to address that. <laughs> they turned away at that question. They don't want to address that. Um, but this is monumental for anyone who's been relying on this federal law. You really have to look at this. And, um, you know, if uh, you might have some unrecorded uh, liability coming, you know, going forward with regard to this, this is their interpretation. Uh, does it apply retroactively? I would say some states might say it does because it's just interpreting how internet-based activity works. Um, so you have to look at this for your uncertain tax positions as well. Uh, now, where it stands now, the executive committee voted uh, to approve that, but it, it, now there's it goes to a survey of their state membership um, for them to give a kind of yay or nay and, and what their thoughts are, but this is the direction. So like I said, nexus and market-based sourcing is just huge. Uh, Kathy, that seems like a very complicated process to take a uh, an in real life kind of position on something that's completely virtual 
And why, if you're going to take that, you know, why would, if I'm calling from Las Vegas, but my home is in South Carolina, why would it not be a, Las, a Nevada transaction if I order something on my phone from there rather than saying it's a South Carolina transaction because that happens to be where I, I live? I, I, I just see a lot of problems with the interpretation they're applying here and the assumptions or, or the shortcuts they're making. So hopefully they'll, they'll get some good feedback and, and make some adjustments here. Yeah, in the direction we're going, businesses are going to need more data, right? I mean, how would you know? You're right. Someone could be only clicking on an app in a different state than where they reside, and you don't have that information. So there's going to be presumptions of what state that applies to. So at the end of the day, expect a lot of litigation in this area, and maybe this will be something that prompts Congress to enact legislation. Um, I'm the past chair of the Technical Resource Panel for State and Local Tax for the AICPA. We are working with some on Capitol Hill, trying to enact some uh, bright line kind of safe harbors for small business. When you look at all these rules for Nexus, what about these small businesses that are selling over the internet? Are you saying that a company that has $30,000 of sales and spread out in different states that they're going to have to file income tax returns in every state? It's just ridiculous. It's not helping our small business community. And in light of the small business um, it, it, that's the area that is hiring most of our employees. And in light of COVID and everything that's happening, do you really want to make it harder for small businesses that they can't, um, they can't grow, they can't hire employees because of this egregious, these egregious rules on Nexus? Um, we are really, really working at a federal level hard to try to get some protection put in place here because they really have crossed over the line, uh, in, in my opinion, and many, many other practitioners and attorneys' opinions as well. Okay, let's go to teleworking employees. Next slide. We'll spend a few minutes on this. Um, so nexus and apportionment considerations. Okay, I can use our firm as an example. We have people, and I'm sure you do as well, working from home or maybe not from home. Maybe, and this is very interesting, I thought Airbnb would have been hit pretty hard uh, in this pandemic, but actually they're doing really well in, the, in respect to um, people wanting some long-term rentals outside of, like if you have an apartment in the city, you want a rental of a house, like maybe in a suburb or somewhere else, but kind of close to where you live. There have been some booms in that for people to telework or just telework in a nice area. I'd rather telework where I can walk out on the beach, right? <laughs> so a lot of people will take advantage of that. Um, but when you're looking at moving employees out from their business locations to remote areas, generally employees working in a state creates nexus, right? We talked about economic nexus, but physical presence nexus as well. Um, majority of states have not issued guidance on how, whether nexus has occurred or not for income tax purposes. Um, is public law 86272 that we just discussed at risk? If you have an employee doing something outside of sales solicitation in the state, that can blow your protection under that federal law. Some states have provided elite relief, but you have to look at that closely and find out how that relief um, applies. And then some in Maryland said, nope, we're not changing our nexus standards. Uh, so if you have employees uh, conducting activity here, yep, we think you're, you have nexus. So most of the states, I would say, are probably going to take advantage of this, again, creating more headache in the area of nexus in light of the events of this year. Also, from an in, not only an income tax perspective, but the payroll tax considerations. So income tax withholding generally applies where the services are performed. However, um, we have some, some states that are overly aggressive, such as the state of New York that has a for the convenience of the employer rule. So what that says is if you are controlled from a New York office, we don't care where your employees are sitting. They could be all over. Uh, you have to withhold New York income tax because unless the employer itself has a location in that other state or has a business reason for you to be working in that state, if it's just you telecommuting, it's New York income tax that's being withheld. So, uh, you know, is that actually 
viable now in light of COVID where New York City shut down and you can't even work in New York in many cases, even if you wanted to, I think there could be some, some good challenges to that rule. Uh, Massachusetts, you know, and New Hampshire are always fighting from a tax perspective. Massachusetts is trying to um, say kind of the same thing that, oh, it's Massachusetts income tax that's withheld if you're in New Hampshire uh, and you're you're just working at home because, you know, their border, their borderline and New Hampshire doesn't have an income tax. So Massachusetts is trying to take that Massachusetts income tax from those that are working maybe exclusively in New Hampshire now. So I think we're going to see some and we have seen um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. It's getting kind of contentious in that area and New Hampshire um, I believe even filed some uh, suit in that area. But um, so, but for the most part, generally income tax withholding from a payroll perspective is going to be where the services are performed. Uh, be careful of reciprocity agreements. Generally, it's okay if you're in a bordering state if the state has reciprocity agreements. But some of those reciprocity agreements only apply for commuting. So how does that apply in this situation? Also be aware of that unemployment insurance follows different rules from income tax withholding. So generally, if you have an, a, an employee in a state and they're, all of their services are going to be localized in that state, no services are expected to be performed outside of that state, then generally that state unemployment tax applies. If, and, and I look at that here from, you know, a, a greater DC area, say your office is in Maryland, um, but you live in Virginia, um, if you perform services in the Maryland office and you actually were controlled from Maryland, even if you were working from home in Virginia, the Maryland unemployment would still apply because some services were performed in Maryland and you're controlled from Maryland. So there are different rules that apply in unemployment, but unemployment's an all or nothing, where income tax withholding, you're gonna be prorating based on where the employee is specifically working. All right, uh, Danny, that brings us to our next polling question, if you'll go ahead and launch that. And Kathy, we did have one question come in. Uh, when we're talking about physical presence nexus, we do have to take into account uh, the rules and how they apply to uh, non-employee service providers, that those that we, we give a 1099 to as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the states have clearly and successfully indicated that anyone acting on your behalf, it doesn't have to be an employee. So if you're paying an independent contractor or paying even another company that is representing you in the state, if they're furthering your market within that state and you're paying them to do so, that absolutely is considered your activity in the state. All right, thank you. Well, let's uh, wrap up this question. Do you have employees teleworking from new states in 2020? Yes, no, or not sure. It looks like uh, we'll give you just a, a little bit more time. A few more of you are answering that question. And uh, we'll share the results in, in um, uh, just about 10 seconds. I think we're at about 88% of you have voted. So we'll give you the, the other 12% another moment or two to uh, make a selection. And looks like we're just about finished time on that. A few more voting. All right. And if you'll share those results. Yeah, so it looks like a good third of you have uh, employees working in new states and going to have some additional income tax, and maybe some, some payroll related uh, tax issues as well. And for those of you that are not sure, um, if it's a good time to, to take a look and sort that uh, now because uh, as you know, uh, W-2s are, are, are due at the end, basically at the end of January. So um, good time to figure all of all of this out. But uh, let's talk, stop talking about income and payroll and move over to sales and use tax. And uh, Lauren, we'll let you uh, carry forward about what's what's been happening since Wayfair was decided a couple of years ago. Thanks, Sarah. So now, obviously, in the last couple of years, there's been significant changes um, with sales tax, and 2020 was absolutely no exception. So you can see um, we have our, our Wayfair map, our, our uh, economic nexus map, and it's been two and a half years since the Supreme Court 
a rule on Wayfair allowing states to impose sales tax obligations on companies if they have enough sales into a state. So you can see, you know, in the last two and a half years, almost every state has turned green and has adopted economic nexus um, with a, a couple exceptions. First, the states with no sales tax. So these are your, uh, your nomad states, New Hampshire, Oregon, Montana, Alaska, and Delaware. And then the two holdouts, um, Florida and Missouri, they are the only two states that have not yet adopted economic nexus. Uh, Florida has been hesitant as you know, they didn't want to appear that they were imposing a new sales tax or a new type of tax, but they did actually introduce a bill. Um, in the past, it, it didn't go through. They had initiated a bill last month and, you know, I expect that it will pass in um, in 2021. Missouri has had um, some compli complications due to their sales tax collection system. So they're trying to get the foundation of their sales tax um, system correct to allow for easier compliance with remote sellers. But I expect that you know, come 2021, we may see this the full map turn green. So looking at the individual states, the movement that we've seen in, in, in 2021 has really been focused on kind of settling in on these uh, thresholds. So most states adopted the Wayfair standard, which was $100,000 of sales or 200 transactions. And what we've seen this year is some movement with those, with those numbers. So Georgia, they lowered their threshold to 100,000 earlier in the year. Um, a big one was Tennessee in October. They lowered their threshold from 500,000 down to 100,000 in October. So that was a big jump. So if you if you missed that um, you know, missed that notice, you might want to look at Tennessee to make sure that you don't have additional filing requirements in that state. And then Arizona, they have a um, they're lowering their threshold in 2021 from 150 down to 100. So I think what we're gonna see, continue to see is you know, some of the movement in these states. Um, I did wanna point out Kansas. Kansas is, oh, not quite there yet. Um, Kansas is an interesting state because Kansas, they adopted economic nexus, but they said that any sales into the state would create economic ne nexus, but the attorney general has ruled that that law has been unconstitutional. So Kansas is in a state of limbo. Um, I expect to see that resolved uh, next year as well. Um, also, one, one of the questions that we get quite frequently when we look at economic nexus is, you know, what, you know, what period are we counting? Most states do look at a calendar year count. So, you know, as we are ending the, um, at ending 2020, it's a good time to look at your look at your annual sales. Make sure that if you have crossed those thresholds, you are registering to collect tax if you need to. And then we also get a lot of questions on what to count. So is it all sales or all taxable sales? Do you include marketplace sales? Um, and that varies from state to state. So you really have to have a very good understanding of what exactly they you're counting when you're looking at these sales thresholds. And what, another question that we get frequently is in regards to trailing nexus. So if you no longer meet these sales thresholds, do you have to still you know, be registered to collect tax um, and remit it, or can you cancel your registration? So many states have um, given guidance that there has to be a certain period of time where you can definitively prove that you no longer meet those nexus thresholds before you can cancel your account. So you know, if your business has taken a dip, it doesn't mean that you can automatically cancel your license right away. You do have to wait a while before you cancel your account. And it has to be with the approval with the Department of Revenue. Now, all that being said, economic nexus, um, you know, it's still very much in play, but I do want to mention physical presence because physical presence is still very much alive and well. And if your company has any sort of physical presence in a state, 
offices, employees, sales reps, agents, if you're performing services, any physical presence in a state will trump economic nexus. So even if you're not meeting these thresholds, if you have physical presence, you do still have nexus um, as far as sales tax is concerned. Now, Kathy discussed Public Law 86272. There is not a carve out for sales tax in that regard. So speaking of physical presence, let's look at now what the COVID impact is for Nexus. And you can move to the next slide here. So you know, Kathy mentioned, obviously, there's a lot of mobilization of the workforce. And it's very unclear, you know, unclear at best, how the states are going to be handling um, the continued you know, working from home aspect and creating sales tax. You know, many states have addressed and given some leniency because of stay-at-home orders, but you know, post post COVID-19, hopefully sooner than later, you know, we will be getting back to normal. But I think we can all agree that the new normal is going to look a little bit different, and we are going to likely have a workforce that, um, you know, that goes beyond the traditional commuting jobs. So we may have employees that, you know that continue to work from home. And it is very important that you take a look at where those employees are to see how that impacts your sales tax nexus requirements. So some other COVID related developments for sales tax, many states did provide um, extensions and penalty relief for um, interest and penalties on late payments extension of due dates for sales tax returns, you know, through, you know, kind of through the, the beginning part of COVID, most of those um, extensions are over and we're kind of back to, back to normal in most states. But there are some states, California was one that did, um, they did institute a program where a, a business could, they could collect sales tax and pay it back over time. And you know that may sound like a great idea and a great way to you know bring cash into the business, but that is a very slippery slope. Um, unpaid sales tax carries a personal liability and it's not dischargeable under bankruptcy. And collected and unremitted sales tax is criminal. So if your business has taken advantage of these pay the sales tax back over time programs, please, please, please make sure that that sales tax is getting paid back over time and, and paid back when it is due. Uh, another issue, kind of COVID related issue is many states or many companies have started implementing COVID surcharges you know, on, on bills or on purchases to account for the increased cost of doing business during this time. Most states will say that that COVID surcharge is taxable. So you need to make sure that you're collecting tax or your point of um, your POS system is set up to collect tax accordingly. This is an area that could be um, a sticky surprise if you should have been collecting tax and you were not. And also with, you know, we, we've all had to be flexible and, and, and pivot and we've, we've seen the changing landscape of business. So it's, you know, it's important to look at some of the different things that you're purchasing or selling to see what the sales tax impact is. So PPE and face masks. Some states are now considering face masks to be part of regular everyday streetwear. As, as sad as that is, um, it, you know, the face masks are now something that is a, a daily requirement for most people. And it, has trended towards moving under clothing. So that is something if you're selling P PPE or especially face masks to look to see, is it now part of clothing? So also some, you know, just some changes in businesses, like for example, restaurants are now selling groceries versus prepared food. Prepared food is generally taxable, whereas many states provide an exemption for groceries. So just the changing nature of what you're selling Make sure that you are adapting your sales tax collection accordingly. So I did want to touch on a 
few different industries. The first one is retail and e-commerce and some of the um, challenges or issues that they've faced over the year. Um, certainly the continued evolution of Wayfair, but also one of the big changes that this industry has seen is the adoption of marketplace facilitator laws. So these are laws where if you are selling on a marketplace, for example, Amazon, it is now Amazon's responsibility to be collecting and remitting sales tax. Right now, all states but three have adopted marketplace facilitator laws. The, you know, no surprise, it's the, the same three states, Florida, Missouri, and Kansas, that still are behind with economic nexus. Um, if you are selling on a marketplace. So one of the questions that we get quite frequently is if you only sell on a marketplace and that marketplace now is responsible for collecting tax, can you cancel your sales tax number? Some states have said yes, some states have said no. So if that is your situation, certainly look and see if you can cancel your sales tax number to prevent or to eliminate some unnecessarily tax filings that you have to do. Another area that I want to mention is if you have inventory in a state because of a marketplace, for example, Amazon FBA, if you participate in that program, you likely have inventory in states across the country. This is a physical presence and this could create sales tax obligations for other non-place, non-marketplace channels. So if you have your own website and you have participate in Amazon FBA, Having inventory in the state will create nexus. So even if your, your own website sales don't hit economic nexus thresholds, you still have a collection responsibility. Um, the marketplace facilitator laws are very new. There is not a lot of guidance as to who's responsible for what under audits. We do look to see some states, or hopefully a lot of states giving guidance as to you know, who's responsible for what. So keep an eye out for that to make sure that, you know, everyone, if, if it is your responsibility, you have um, proper procedures in place for, you know, audit support. And then, you know, along the same lines, there are still a host of issues around meal delivery services, such as Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats. So if this is you know, the industry that you're in, you know, there is still a lot of challenges and um, not a lot of resolution for, for the states on these. So look for you know, further guidance to come. Uh, I did wanna just quickly touch on the, to me, the, the soap opera saga of what's happening in California. So California has been notoriously, um, you know, notoriously aggressive towards FBA sellers. And, and this really goes back to pre-marketplace laws, but um, California always had the position that it was that third party seller that was responsible for collecting and remitting the sales tax, not the marketplace. And they were very aggressive, sent out a lot of notices, um, really were very aggressive of, of getting that tax from the FBA sellers until marketplace uh, laws went into effect. Um, the Online Merchant Guild has filed suit against California for these, you know, the, these historical periods. So we'll see, you know, we are closely following that to see um, what will happen, but it is a kind of a continuing saga of, you know, how, um, how aggressive California has been, which kind of leads to the next point here with California and the income tax compliance surge for Amazon sellers. So again, um, Amazon sellers, typically have inventory in California, and that has created some you know, unique opportunities for California to send out notices for income tax, uh, you know, income tax responsibility. So, you know, Kathy touched on how aggressive the states are being, having physical presence in the state. Physical presence can be created by inventory. So, you know, California is probably the first state that's getting very aggressive towards FBA sellers, but I think we can see a lot of um, states to follow. One last thing, Washington. So Washington does have marketplace laws in effect. Um, Washington also has a B&O tax. So even if you're selling only on a marketplace, 
you still have responsibilities to file the sales tax return because the B&O tax is on that same return. So moving to technology, just a few things that I wanted to mention in, you know, for this industry, you know, they have been hit very hard with Wayfair and really looking at you know, expanding their Nexus footprint if they are selling in multi-states. And the challenge that technology industry space is that the tax law is really far behind in compared to the advances of technology. So the, the three biggest challenges that technology companies continue to face is really defining and characterizing what it is that they're selling. Are they selling a service? Or are they selling software? And you know, sometimes we have to get granular and look at the contract and the terms and conditions and how, how the product is priced and sold to really get to that answer. Also sourcing, Kathy touched on this with income tax. This is also a, a big, um, big challenge for tech companies because where is the customer, um, where's the product or the service or the benefit received? And then bundled services. So, you know, for a lot of tech companies, they are mixing both taxable and non-taxable elements together in one price. And that does create a lot of sales tax implications. So really getting, you know, getting to these three challenges is the biggest challenge for tech companies. And it continues just to get more and more complicated. Um, I did just want to uh, give a quick shout out to um, on-demand webinars. So if you're in the tech space, um, if you have moved to doing, moving from in-person, training or um, to, to digital, you need to be careful that you haven't crossed the line into selling digital goods. Many states do tax digital goods and there has been some guidance by a few states, but this is something certainly to keep in mind. Um, moving on to manufacturing, just wanna hit a couple big points here. So you know, not, not a lot of changes with tax laws, but really best practices. So with, you know, with supply chain disruptions, you have a lot of new suppliers. You must get exemption certificates to them to make sure that they are not charging tax when, um, when you're buying exempt goods. So um, also looking at, looking at exemptions that your company may be applicable for, for new equipment that you've had to buy for pivoting your business, new PPE or cleaning protocols, seeing if those can fit into some existing exemptions that are out there. Um, I mean, obviously, contraction of workforce, more people are going to have to take on sales tax responsibilities and making sure that they have the knowledge to make correct tax decisions, whether they're purchasing goods or whether they're paying for goods or whether they're filing sales tax responsibilities. And then certainly audits, we anticipate that there's going to be a lot of audits in the future. Some low hanging fruit would be making, would be validating that a manufacturer has customer exemption certificates on hand for their customers. So that is certainly something that your company should be making sure that you've got all your, all the ducks in a row as far as exemption certificates from your customers. So you know, as we wrap up 2020, some things that I recommend doing would be really taking a look at your internal sales tax for a review process. You can move to the next slide. So first, monitor your nexus. You know, economic nexus laws that have had changes within 2020, look at the impact for the remote workforce. Ensure that your products and services that you've introduced or had to pivot to in 2020 are correctly taxed. Make sure that any new suppliers have been given appropriate resale certificates and make sure that your exemption certificates that you've collected from your customers are good. And then any resale certificates or licenses that need to be um, renewed, get renewed. I do want to mention Alabama has a new requirement in 2021 for, um, for renewing your certificate. I know we're running out of time here, but um, yeah, for, 
Question Can you three. just go ahead and put the polling question up and uh, while folks are answering this one and then uh, if you've answered three of our polling questions, you're good for today. If you've missed one, we'll put up the fourth question in just a moment so you can make sure that you've answered three. But uh, while these are up and um, we're asking those, Kathy, any any thoughts on trends yeah. for 2021? Yeah, and I will wrap it up with that. Um, you know, it's interesting that the states um, have seen some decline in revenues from March to August is 6.4%. However, there are some states that actually have benefited and their October receipts were more than they projected. Um, so, you know, states aren't wanting to enact new taxes. However, um, it may be increasing some rates. New Jersey has en enacted a surtax. Um, states may be expanding income to foreign income, including that, enacting gross receipts tax. And we also have some new legislation that came through with legalizing marijuana and sports wagering that should also provide more money to the states. So Wayfair increases in sales tax collection um, and these other excise taxes. You know, the states might not be terribly off, but we are, we will expect, I think, you know, overall the states are going to need some more money. And you can read through those last few slides. We expect lots of audits taxation on digital products um, probably as well. All right, thanks. And for those of you that might have missed an earlier question, we'll go ahead and put up question four to make sure that you've uh, answered at least three out of those four. And uh, Lauren, any quick thoughts on what 2021 may look like from a sales and use tax? Um, I really anticipate the states are really going to be looking at enforcement for non-compliant sellers. So, you know, especially as as far as Wayfair is concerned, really looking for companies that should be registered to collect tax and, you know, and they're not. So more focused than ever on you know, getting as many people or as many companies collecting tax on their behalf as possible. And looking at the income tax side as well while they're looking at sales tax. <laughs> exactly. Two for one. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I expect that companies are, are that states and cities and localities are going to be looking for tax dollars after a, a slow economic year in 2020 um, and a lot of needs they've needed to pay for in the communities. So uh, mm -hmm. the easiest place to come get it is is ask a business. Don't ask an individual because uh, the individuals vote, businesses don't. But uh, We'll we'll see how that trends out. But thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Kathy, for our update today. And uh, if you did not get a copy of the handouts from the handouts pod, we'll stay online here for just another minute or two to allow you to, a chance to click on that handout section and download a copy of today's materials. And thank you all very much. We appreciate it and have a good rest of the year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.